My friends, let me welcome you here today for this service of thanksgiving for the life of Rinska Moritz. My name is David Hodgins and for a number of years served as the pastor of the church here in Warrnambool, which Hank and Rinska made their home. In the years that they were part of the church, like many of you, I became embroiled in more than one of Rinska's areas of passion, caught up in some of her schemes and a raft of other ministry as she shared her life and love for Jesus. Today, we gather in the context of great sadness as we acknowledge her death. I could use softer euphemisms for what I've just said. For instance, we acknowledge her passing or her loss to us but in a world that has largely insulated us from the reality of death, we need to name what has happened for what it is. Rinska's life is gone from us, and it's a natural and normal part of grief. Grief is an unpleasant emotion that manifests itself in all sorts of ways, especially in the context of the death of a loved one. And as a result, it is important to acknowledge its reality to accept that on an occasion like this and on other occasions yet to be experienced, there will be tears which are accompanied by feelings of great loss and deep sadness. The loss of a loved one of whose life was characterised by such enthusiasm and energy and care for others is indeed a painful season in life. But today we don't gather as those without hope. For we believe in the bodily resurrection of all those whose trust is in Christ Jesus as Saviour. Rinska was convinced of this truth, which has been revealed through God's word and experienced it in her life, that Jesus was the Saviour who came into this world to bear the consequences of her sins, that he died and was raised back to life by the power of God. Rinska lived with this conviction that she had been granted eternal life. And so when Hank rang me just over a week or so ago to let me know that Rinska had died, he was able to say with calm assurance that Rinska is now in heaven with the Lord that she loved. Our gathering today, therefore, is a strange combination of grief and celebration. And in this context, both are appropriate. There's grief because, as I've just said, a loved one has died and this loss affects us deeply. But we celebrate too. We celebrate Rinska's unflagging enthusiasm and contribution to friendships, to the community, the church, and the kingdom of God. We celebrate the differences, the difference that she made in the lives of many people and the organisations that she was involved with. But most significantly, we celebrate her faith in God, faith which shaped her, informed her, and empowered her. And in celebrating her faith, we give the glory and honour that is due to God, the God that she served, the God who has triumphed over death. And so today we're going to do a number of things to celebrate Rinska's life. We're going to sing. And I want to emphasise that there is a plural in that word. We, together, are going to sing. I'm not a song leader. In fact, I can think of a thousand other jobs I'd prefer to do. Uh, so I'm going to rely on you as we sing some songs that Rinska loved. She loved songs, she loved music, and insisted that we had lots of songs in our service today. And so we're going to rely on your good grace to actually lead that for us. We will hear some stories of life as Dorothy, Rinska's younger sister, brings us a compendium of stories shared by friends and family to honour Rinska's life. And we'll pray and hear the word of God reflecting on the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the focus of Rinska's faith, and the dynamic that energised her care and concern for people, and so reflected the character of God. As we continue to worship, though, let's pray together. Please join me as I pray. God of eternity and giver of life, this afternoon we come together to give thanks for the life of Rinska Moritz. We acknowledge again our dependence on you in all seasons of life and especially in the context of walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Our prayer then is that then is throughout this time that as we gather we might experience the comfort that you grant to those who are grieving 
and pray this might truly be the experience of those closest to Rinska who feel her death so intensely. As we face the reality of our own mortality, help us to be clear-minded about eternity. And the words spoken by Jesus when he said that I am the way, the truth and the life. And so we come to you, our Father, and ask that your presence would be felt by each one gathered here today and that we might find comfort, assurance and a deep challenge to faith in the testimony of Rinska's life. And we ask this in the name of our living Saviour, Jesus. Amen. So here's your opportunity to shine. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing the first song that you'll find there in the service sheet that you were given on the way in. Blessed Be Your Name, a song that's been around for a while, but one that I certainly remember Rinska singing with some gusto. Let's stand together and sing. Thank you. Please have a seat. We're going to have a reading from Psalm 23, a very well-known scripture, and Jordan's going to come and read that for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jordan. We're going to have another opportunity for you to sing. 
this time a song that Rinska chose for us that is not so well known by either the pianist or myself. However, we're confident that we'll be able to carry this one off. So uh, just remember as we sing this, no harm will come to anyone. Um, and we'll honour Rinska by having a good crack at it. So let's stand together and sing of the goodness of God. It's a song chosen because it does articulate the very uh, strong sense of God's goodness that Rinska lived with. Thank you. You may have a seat. You may also like to check that song out on Spotify later and see how it was meant to be sung. <laughs> and we are so thankful that this service is not being video recorded or live streamed. <laughs> Which is a shame in a way because some of the stories that we're going to hear need to be told. And we do want to invite Dorothy Cool to come and share some of those stories. Rinska's younger sister accompanied by some other relatives. Thanks, Dorothy. 
Hi, I'm Dorothy, I'm Rin's sister, and this is Nikita and Anna, Rin's granddaughters, and Nikita has written a poem that she just wants to share as a surprise. Grandparents come and grandparents go, but Grandma, I didn't want you to go. Hold my hand, my precious girls, I will watch you from above. There are so many things we still have to say, but Grandma, now you're not here for another day. Hold my hands, my precious girls, from heaven I'll be watching from above. Regrets will have many of all the things you'll miss. Hold my hand, my precious girls, no regrets here. Let's just enjoy the last time we still have to hold each other. There is school and there is sport and there is so many things. There's a hole in our hearts from the joy that you bring. Hold my hand, my precious girls, I will be there cheering you on. We have memories to cherish, my sister and I, and there are snacks you lovingly cooked, and there's visits with pizza and your audiobooks. We know you were happy to see your father again, but we want you here. We miss you, and we don't want you gone. One day we will be together, and I will hold you once more. Until we meet again, Grandma, we love you. Thanks, Makita. Welcome to sit or stand, it's up to you. <laughs> okay, um, so this is for Rin. It's a collection of memories. Life is messy, and today we see that life can suddenly be over. So today we gather to reflect, to grieve, to comfort one another, to think about our own lives, and to remember Rin. Five months ago, only five months, we heard the news that Rin had papillary renal cell carcinoma type 2. This is a very rare cancer, there was no treatment, and there was no real idea of the pathway that this cancer would take. As we know now, it moved very quickly and very aggressively, and Rin has been sick for five months. Rin faced this with extraordinary courage and realism and grace. She never complained. She's been overwhelmed by the many gestures of love that she has received from God and from and often through people. Hank has been an incredible carer for Rin in the last months. Hank has really showed to all of us how deeply he loved her. Still does. And we're very grateful, Hank. You showed that amazingly in these last few months. But I want to say now thank you to everyone else who have prayed for her, who've prayed with her, people who sent cards, people who sent messages, phone calls, visits, flowers, gifts, meals, text messages. She was surrounded by love and she was very grateful. Hank, too, is very grateful for the love and the care people have shown them in recent months. And sadly, Rin was kind of surprised by it. She said to me once, I didn't know these people loved me. But aren't we lucky that we had the chance to let her know we did love her? We did get that time, and I'm grateful. Last week, when we told our mum, who's 99 years old, the sad news that Rin had passed away. Mum sat quietly for a bit, and then she said, some will say that Rin has gone, but we can say she has arrived. Our comfort today is that Rin is in heaven, not because she was especially good, but because we have a God who forgives, and her trust was in his grace and his love to her. Rin is a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, an aunt, a cousin, a stepmother, a grandmother, a neighbour, a friend, a workmate, a fellow volunteer, a church member. To everybody in this room, she was something different. Like a diamond with lots of facets, each of us knew her differently. And we gather today to comfort one another in the reality that her life on earth has come to an end. But also that we can today share our stories of Rin and just be together. As I was preparing for today, I prayed and I asked God to help me because everyone here knew Rin differently, but somehow we want to celebrate her together today and share our memories, our gratitude, 
as well as our sadness. So we've actually asked a range of people who knew her well to share their memories. I see this eulogy as a memory box, a collection of memories. Each will show something different about Rin and what she meant to different people. I'm going to start with Fred, Rin's oldest brother, only brother, who remembers Rin this way. Rin was the first in our family to come to grips with modern technology. After finishing intermediate at Concordia College in Adelaide, she went to business college to train as a shorthand typist, and all her life, she kept up with new developments as they applied to her work. She found that fun. Fred remembers her typing his thesis for his honours degree. It was 100 pages in triplicate, in German, no errors allowed. This was before spell check at the end of 1970, and she did it really well. Fred also remembers with gratitude the effort and generosity Rin went to in organising a trip to the Netherlands for the two of them in 1999. They enjoyed great family hospitality and visited, among other places, Minitzha, which is Rinska's birthplace. They went bike riding on the dikes. They saw so many delightful sights and were blessed with great family time during this summer experience of Europe. And Fred just says, thanks, Rin. Then on a few years later, he was welcomed on several occasions when he arrived in Warrnambool with grandchildren who enjoyed meeting the dogs, Amber and Sitska, and playing in the faraway tree in their yard. Recently, Rin and Hank enjoyed serving with MMM and Rin enthusiastically showed Fred around a project they were working on in North Summit near Adelaide. Last December, I too visited Rin and Hank when they were working at Mill Valley Ranch in Tainong. Rin was really fit and strong, and she was helping lifting roofing iron onto roofs while I was there, having just finished plastering an old house. Helen and Corey popped in to visit there too. None of us had a clue of the illness that would strike so hard and so aggressively a month later. Ian, Rin's son, remembers Rin reading Narnia stories and the magic faraway tree to him and Stephen. Ian said she made it fun because she did voices for the various characters. Ian remembers Mr Tumnus, Dame Washalot and Moonface, all with their distinct voices. Earlier this year, while Rin was sick, she actually enjoyed reading all seven Narnia books again herself. They remain a special favourite. Rin also loved to make relishes, pickles and sauces from their and their friends' and neighbours' gardens. And Ian will now miss the assorted relishes and pickles and sauces that Rin loved to make from her garden produce and give to him. Stephen will forever value the sense of family that Rin helped him and Ian develop, as when they had weekends and holidays with their mum, they often spent time with the extended family. And to this day, Stephen says that he feels close to family. He says, even when we don't see each other a lot, I feel comfortable with the family. And that's what makes today so very, very important. I want to personally say thank you to all the cousins who have come along to support Ian and Stephen today. I think it's really precious. There was times in the Grampians, Eden, Marimbula, Phillip Island, or family events. They all feature powerfully in Stephen's memories. And incidentally, he also enjoyed reading to Anna and Nikita, making the stories more interesting by doing them in various accents. I can remember when they were little, he might do a page in Irish and then he'd do a page in something else, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was quite funny. I did once read a story to these girls and they told me I didn't do it as good as you did. <laughs> Ask him later over a cuppa to do some voices for you. <laughs> Ian and Stephen also love, remember Rin's love of things being organised. Even the Lego was sorted out by colours. Incidentally, Beth does that too. It's a family trait. She sorts the Lego into colours and she had these special brown Harris coffee containers. I've still got one. And each Lego colour had its own container. Yes, Ian also remembered building Lego cities over the table on a Saturday afternoon. Incidentally, Stephen does wonder why Rin always insisted in naming her cars. The Datsun, D for Datsun, yeah, kind of, makes sense. 
Benny was named after his number plate, but Cobber, Vi, Frisbee, Hanks caught this weird little trait, and he refers to their mobile home as Jimmy, too. Nikita made Rin laugh recently when she commented, Grandma, I'm surprised you haven't got a name for your cancer yet. <laughs> and Rin laughed. Ben remembers, on one of our winter holidays in Eden, we were in cabins at Quarantine Bay, and one night Rin, Ian and Stephen joined Ben out in the boat and went out to the chip mill where they caught heaps of squid. Ben was trying to keep the boat clean, but apparently there was a bit of a squid ink fight going on out there and the boat was covered. Rin then insisted on being taught how to clean them and stayed out at the fish cleaning table till nearly midnight, cleaning squid and then helping Ben clean all the ink off the boat. It was winter and it was cold. Stephen does remember us enjoying freshly caught deep fried calamari in our cabins the next day. And those cabins were old and cheap. And we had to bring lots of coins because the electricity was coin operated and we had to put coins in for our hot water and our power. Beth remembers one Christmas that she and Emma rode their ponies to Auntie Rin's house in Mount Evelyn. And another time having peanut butter sandwiches there after she and Emma finished the shorter version of the 40 hour famine. She says, Peter, peanut butter sandwiches have never tasted so good again. Emma remembers when Auntie Rin got a maroon car. Do we know the name? She says, I thought it was so fancy because it had a velvet interior and electric windows. Stephen's nodding. One time she let Laura Hoffman and me drive it in the paddock at our place. I was sitting on her lap. I'm not sure how that came about, but it was fun. Was that Vi? Was that car Vi? Oh, Vi was a Volvo. V for Volvo, of course. Oh, and the Volvo was called Ruby. There we go. <laughs> Rin also loved gardening. I remember the transformation that took place at Rin's house in Margaret Road, Mount Evelyn, when she took two weeks off work to landscape the garden herself. The backyard was just grass and a few trees, but in that fortnight, she drew out an enormous hourglass shape as big as the backyard and filled it with edged garden beds. Jimmy, the camper, led to many happy hours on Australian roads for Rin and Hank and their involvement with MMM and Samaritan's Purse, where Rin and Hank both love serving and being part of wonderful teams of people. Real and precious friendships came out of that. Alice, Rin's sister, is grateful for that vehicle, as twice in recent years, Rin and Hank came all the way to Derby WA and spent time with her. The first time meeting up at Fitzroy Crossing and exploring Geeky Gorge, then coming to Derby where they had fun playing crazy card games in the evenings. We went to the tiny Derby Baptist Church on the Sunday and swelled their numbers as Ben and I and my our, our relatives Bill and Nanny were there as well. The next time they came up, Hank was recovering from the flu, so Rin and Alice checked out Derby together and had fun, but again the three of them had a relaxing and fun time together Rin and Hank could park Jimmy in the driveway and move into the house for a few days of in-house luxury. Now even more, Alice is deeply grateful for the time they shared up north so recently. And Alice will also be very grateful that in the past month she's been able to come down and stay with Rin's neighbour Gwen and be able to see Rin at, regularly. At that stage, Rin could still enjoy playing phase 10, and they even did some colouring in with the much-loved Derwent colour pencils, which is a little bit of a family thing. We love our Derwent colour pencils. It's no secret that Rin and Hank loved cruising. Recently, when I asked Hank if he would like me to share a memory for today, he had this to say about how it all began. He said, Doff, I have 23 wonderful years of memories. I don't know where to start in isolating two or three. But... Early in our marriage, when we were both still working, we'd gone two and a half years without a break and we were both dog tired. I sent Rin to the travel agent to find us a holiday. When I came home that night, she said, we're going on a cruise. Hank said, but I get seasick. <laughs> and she just said, you'll get used to it, you'll love it. <laughs> and he did. And they both loved it and did 12 more over the next 15 years or so. The cruise around Australia was her favourite and she had tentatively booked to do it again next summer. They went on a golf cruise once. Really, Hank? 
a golf cruise. But more extreme was to come when Rin's friend Joy mentioned a crochet cruise. I can imagine that Hank was perhaps a tad less excited about that one. I would have loved to have seen his face when that was suggested. But Rin is obviously quite persuasive as the crochet cruise went ahead. When I asked Rin what her favourite part of cruising was, she was unhesitating in her reply, the ship itself. It wasn't really the ports, it was just life on board. Rin loved it, so does Hank. Rin's sister Helen remembers that when our mum was 90, we went on a cruise as a family. Ben and Fred did not come, so Hank and Corrie endured 10 days afloat with mum and her four daughters. One day, us four girls were in the pool, reminiscing about how when we were little girls playing in the water, we could imagine ourselves to be really good at ballet or gymnastics, because the water holds you up. You can do amazing things in the water. So we decided the four of us would give synchronised swimming a go. <laughs> Funnily enough, we had the pool to ourselves. Maybe everybody just left. And Corrie took some funny photos as we attempted to each head to a corner of the pool and put our feet out and touch the other person's feet to make a star. But the problem with that was our heads kept going underwater and we just couldn't hold the formation and we also couldn't stop laughing. When we looked up, we had quite an audience. Mum was sitting on the edge of the pool laughing and for the rest of the cruise, people would come up to her and she ask if she was the mother of those four in the pool. Hank was reading a Neville shoot book nearby, probably hoping desperately that no one would link him to the crazy females in the swimming pool. <laughs> Brother-in-law Corrie joined our family in 1970 and he has many memories of Rin. He recalls her as always being passionate in all her endeavours and work. She was adaptable to her circumstances and would change easily, like a chameleon sometimes. There are many times he recalled that she changed, which made her frustrating to deal with. But with all our warts and all, she was a loving sister who knew where she was going and beat us all to heaven to be with her dad. Gwen is Rin and Hank's long-term neighbour. And she says that when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, he ended it by asking, who was a neighbour to the man? And the answer was, the one who cared for him. Gwen saw Rin as a neighbour like that. Rin was by nature a busy person, but she made time to care for people around the neighbourhood. She was also very good at volunteering Hank for jobs. One morning, Gwen woke to find all her hens dead as a fox had visited overnight. She was devastated. Rin was there to comfort and encourage her and promptly enlisted Hank's help in covering the yard with chook netting. The job took three full days. Gwen is still grateful to her friends next door. Gwen says Rin's also known for her baking, which she often shared with an elderly man across the street. Joy, a friend from church, fondly remembers the time she and Rin served together in women's ministry, which Rin sometimes emceed. Joy said she was never short of a word. I'm not sure if any of us or many of us remember what she said, but we all remember the brightly coloured cloth bag of lollies that she would share around just for fun. Hank has a memory of when he and Rin first met. They seemed to find so much to talk about together. In their conversation, Rin said, I'm thirsty. So she grabbed Hank's glass of wine and had some. And he remembers thinking, this is my type of girl. <laughs> and she was. Linda remembers that she and Rin loved to op shop. Her favourite was meeting up in Colac for the day and going around to all the op shops collecting Johnson of Australia plants or Chinese crockery and then sitting down for a nice coffee lunch catch up. She says, wherever we went, if there was an op shop, we had to have a look. But I'd have to say that our most memorable purchase would have to have been on our trip to Queensland where on the way home, Rin purchased an organ which we just managed to fit in the car. Nicole's first memory of Rin was when she came to the Mount Evelyn Reform Church and she was watching Rin sign songs. Nicole said, I'd never seen that before as we were new to the church and it was beautiful to watch. While we're on the topic of signing, Elise too remembers that Auntie Rin learnt Auslan at TAFE when Elise was a teenager. This has always meant a lot to Elise. 
Later, as an adult, she and Rin exchanged many text messages around cooking and recipes and gardening. And Elise loves baking Auntie Rin's that Dutch gingerbread thingy, cake thingy that she makes. They share a bond. Jen remembers that when she went to visit, Rin always made an apple cake with cream. If she knew what your favourite sweet was, she would make sure she had it when you visited. And her nibble platter was always strategically and carefully arranged in a piece of art. We always enjoyed that. I remember too, Jen, Jen Rin's nibble platters were visually beautiful. Karen has fond memories of the family receiving crocheted Christmas stockings filled with lollies and that she would hide them in the faraway tree. It didn't matter how big the kids got, they still loved that. Geordie has memories of grandma's love of crochet. She says, I'm fortunate that she taught me and I love it too. When I was younger, I wasn't always the fastest at crochet or the most patient. Grandma would wait till I was asleep and then go and work her magic. I would wake up the next morning to find my latest project had magically grown. She would say the crochet fairy had been to visit. Today I say goodbye and thank you to my crochet fairy. Sister-in-law, Jo, from South Australia, sends her condolences today and she said that her fondest memories of Rin are around a quirky sense of humour which they shared. She also loved hearing Rin's voice on radio every Wednesday morning and to listen to her well-chosen devotions and matching songs. Later, she would share the hymns with her neighbour, Ruby, who also offers her condolences today. Jo says, Rin has a special place in my heart and I know we will meet again. About a week before Rin died, I prayed with her. She was so incredibly frail by then. Out of my mouth came, before you stands an open door, which all of us must one day go through. Later, I looked up where that came from and I found it in the last book of the Bible in Revelation 3, verse 8. Jesus is speaking and he says, I know all the things you do and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength left. She was so weak at that time. Yet you have obeyed me and my word and did not deny me. Later on in a conversation with our mum, I shared that verse and mum said, it's true, you know, no one can close that door that Jesus has opened. We can't even close it ourselves. Wow. Jesus knows all about all of us. He knows the good. He knows the bad. But he forgives anyone, everyone who comes and asks and opens that door. I'd like to close with Rin's own words, which she shared at church here in Warrnambool earlier this year. She was asked to reflect on what Easter meant to her, and she said, Because of Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday, I have been given a new life, a new start. Yesterday, with all its mistakes, is gone. Because I believe that Jesus rose again, every day is a new day with new opportunities, and whatever happens from here on, I need never fear. Rin assured me in her final days that she had no fear. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. We thank God for that. I know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. You've all got memories of Rin. And after the service, we'd encourage you to grab a cuppa. And can you all share with somebody a memory of Rin? Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm confident that many of us have learnt something new today, preeminent amongst which is probably that there is such a thing as a crochet cruise, Hank. <laughs> Who could have imagined? <laughs> We're going to stand and sing again a well-known hymn, Because He Lives, that picks up the theme that Dorothy was just sharing, that Jesus has been resurrected, he's come to love, heal and forgive. Let's stand together and sing these words of promise.
Thank you. Please have a seat. It's very normal in a service like this when we've had the opportunity to reflect on a person's life like we have uh, been doing their relationships, their character and how they've lived to reflect in a very positive way about the person. And I want to buck that trend a little bit this afternoon as I've had the opportunity too to reflect on Rinska's life because there was one occasion when she did something that upset me terribly, <laughs> an action which Rinska was blithely unaware of at the time but one which had the potential to be the cause of ongoing trauma and uh, trauma for me and our relationship. In fact, it could have ended the friendship on the spot. It so happened that I'd been invited to meet with Rinska and the school principal at Warrnambool West Primary School and I turned up for the meeting ahead of time and was invited by Rinska into the inner sanctum of the school administration wing while we waited for the availability of the incumbent principal. The person who was in the role at the time was keen on reptiles. I think the uh, correct term is he was something of a herpetologist and there was a well-appointed terrarium in the office inhabited by a python of moderate but not inconsiderate size. And to my surprise, and without invitation, Rinska opened the terrarium, reached in and with one smooth motion lifted the snake out into the fresh air and proceeded to hand Madam Slither, or I think the snake was named, uh, to me. I was so traumatised, I'm not sure that the snake was called Madam Slither, but we'll go with that today. Now, in a previous life, I had worked in an environment where snakes were very common, frequently encountered, and very dangerous. They were the deadly King Browns. And so, to be honest, I had no interest whatsoever in handling Madam Slither, or any snake for that matter. And yet, suddenly, I was left holding this reptile, not knowing what to do or what to expect. I put on a very brave face because there were children in the school and it doesn't look good to show weakness to a grade four child who could probably hand, handle Madam Slither with great familiarity. So I stood there with this snake that started to explore its freedom, starting to slither up my arm towards my head and my face. I could feel perspiration tingling down the back of my neck and I stood there quietly cursing this person who had handed me this snake. <laughs> What are you thinking, Rinska? And I tell you that story not so much to smudge Rinska's character in any way, but to illustrate to you just how deeply embedded she was in the culture of the school. And that was characteristic of any project or ministry that she took on. When Rinska took on a project or some form of ministry, it really was given 100%, as Dorothy has already indicated for us. And as we walked around the school that day, Rinska did one of her characteristic kind of Rinska guided tours. Uh, it was clear that everybody knew her and loved her from staff and students alike. You could say that was true if not for all, but certainly most contexts that Rinska was involved in. And the question that is worth reflecting on here today is to ask why did Rinska put herself into those projects? Why did she give herself so fully to everything that she did? After her retirement, her life was not one of lazy days sitting in the sunshine, at least not terribly often, I don't imagine. She was involved in such a wide range of activities, and we've heard some of those inside and outside the church. In April just this year, our paths crossed again when Hank and Rinska were in Albury with mobile mission maintenance uh, we've heard some stories of their engagement there and even though Rinska was not particularly well on a beautiful autumnal day, she insisted on getting behind the lawnmower and mowing the, uh, the front area out in front of the church. And our tongue-in-cheek answer to that question, why did Rinska throw herself so, uh, so busily into everything, maybe that she was born with the Energizer Bunny batteries or perhaps that there was something in her Dutch genetics that meant she could not sit long. But if you would ask Rinska, I think her answer would be that her personal experience of the love of God was so profound and so life-changing that it actually 
motivated her, gave her the love and the desire and the energy to care for others in the manner of Jesus, her saviour. And we've seen that in evidence, haven't we? And as I've reflected on Rinska's life and ministry, particularly in the years that I've known her, there are four elements of the gospel that were fundamental to her life and service. And she asked very explicitly that I share some of these things with you today. Although she grew up in a home which worshipped and served God, she acknowledged there was a time in life when she walked a little away from faith. God did not move and in his infinite goodness called her back to him. And she returned, not to just a better life or better relationships, but to be, know, uh, to be known and to know God. And in a prayer that Jesus prayed to his father that we have recorded for us in John 17, 3, Jesus said, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. Rinska knew the Lord and dearly wanted others to know the love and life and freedom that there is in relationship with God. And in these last days, she faced her own mortality. Rinska knew that life on earth was not the end because being known by God meant being with him through all eternity. And so she did face her own mortality with quiet assurance. She also knew that at the core of the gospel or the good news is that her sin has been dealt with. Rinska was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. She would be modified by the thought that we might put her on the pedestal of a saint. The idea that our actions might be in any way offensive to God is a very unpopular one in our day. This idea of relativism, the notion of having to repent of anything is equally unpopular. However, the scripture teaches that because of our rebellion, because of our desire to be the lords of our own lives, we've fallen short of God's glorious standard and as a result, we stand under judgment. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says that the wages of sin or of our rebellion, if you like, is death. And that's how it's been through human history. And for very good reasons, we deserve to carry that penalty. But the gift of God that Rinska knew and loved was the free gift of grace, eternal life through Christ Jesus who took the penalty of sin for us. For God to be God and for God to be good, he has to punish sin. No good father would ever overlook such a grievous offence as our rebellion against him is to God. Jesus stood in Rinska's place when he went to the cross, just as he stood in my place and the place of anyone who wants to benefit from his work. What a glorious gift of grace that is. Rinska knew that, lived that, and her life was given to sharing that message. The third thing, Rinska knew that the gospel was all God's doing. If busyness ever made us right with God, then Rinska might well be first in line. But she was never so presumptuous as to believe that she could earn favour with God, because none of us can. Ephesians 2, 9, uh, Paul says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not by your own doing, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If you ever spent any time with Rinsky, you soon realised that it was not about her, it was about Jesus. It was Jesus she gave credit to for her freedom and life. And her experience of the gospel gave birth to acts of service. She was never one to push a social agenda or to try and improve the lot of someone in need just because they were good things to do, though they were good things to do. Whenever she served, though she may not have said it in as many words, it was always service to Jesus. And once she committed, it was always full on. I still smile about the fact that from time to time when uh, she was exploring possibilities, she would say, I'll just go and check in with Hank on that and see whether, uh, whether I'll be able to do that. And it wasn't so much about being under Hank's thumb, at least I don't believe so. But she would check with Hank, and once Hank had given her the green light, then she would overcommit. <laughs> that was life with Rinska. There was such enthusiasm each year, for instance, around Christmas time when she would play the entire Handel's Messiah at Three Way. And she longed that people be inspired by the beauty and the magnificence of the orchestral composition, but most significantly that people would hear the message of hope that there was in the lyrics, lyrics that exalted Jesus as saviour of the world. 
the saviour we celebrate at Christmas. Her mentoring, the work she did with children, helped them improve their reading or taught them how to knit. But those were the tools that she used to demonstrate in a very practical way the love of God to them. I want to finish this part of our service today with a quote from a theologian named Michael Horton. He writes these words. The heart of most religions is good advice, good techniques, good programs, good ideas and good support systems. These drive us deeper into ourselves to find inner light, inner goodness, inner voice or inner resources. Nothing new can be found inside of us. There is no inner rescuer deep down in my soul. I just hear echoes of my own voice telling me all sorts of crazy things to numb my sense of fear, anxiety, boredom, the origins of which I cannot truly identify. But the heart of Christianity is good news. It comes not as a task for us to fulfil, a mission for us to accomplish, a game plan for us to follow with life coaches, but as a report that somebody else has already fulfilled, accomplished, followed and achieved everything for us. Good advice might help in daily direction. The good news concerning Jesus Christ saves us from sin's guilt and tyranny over our lives and the fear of death. It's good news because it doesn't depend on us. It's about God and his faithfulness to his purposes and promises. And one of the great promises that Rinska held fast to was that God, who had commenced a good work in her, in granting to her the gift of eternal life, would carry it on until it was complete. And though we sit in the context of sadness and loss today, we give thanks that Jesus' work in Rinska is now fully complete, a work that God longs to do in anyone who trusts Christ as Saviour. Let's pray together. Great God of life, again today in our service we pause to give thanks to you for the life of Rinska Moritz. We thank you for the grace that you extended to her in bringing her into relationship with you. We thank you that her love for Jesus was so obviously manifest in her relationship, not just with you but with others as well. And as we have reflected on her life today, we thank you for the many memories that have been called to our attention for the stories that have made us laugh and bring a tear to our eyes. May these memories of your servant continue to inspire us and encourage us. And again today, God, we pray for Hank and the extended family as they adjust to this new stage of life. Grant to them your peace and comfort, we ask. Hide them in the shelter of your wing and help them to rest in the shadow of Almighty God. For we pray this in the name of the resurrected Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn today. At the conclusion of this hymn, I'll invite you to stay standing. This hymn was written by Horatio Spatford, a guy who experienced deep tragedy in his life, but nevertheless declared that his soul was safe in the hands of God. Let's stand and sing.
In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Lord said, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Salient words for us to consider as we conclude our service. Funeral services are first and foremost, of course, about the loved one who has passed away, and today we have rightly focused on Rinska's life, but there are also opportunities to consider our own lives, what our priorities are, where our energy is being spent, who we are being influenced by and who we influence, along with the big question of what's going to happen when it's our time to come to a conclusion in this earthly life. Rinska faced death with no anxiety about what was beyond the grave because she had a personal relationship with Jesus. And in preparing this service, she made it very clear to me that she wanted others not only to know that, but to have the same opportunity that she had. So as you go today, let me appeal to you to consider how you're going to live and how coming to know Jesus brings transformation in life. As we conclude our service, we want to express our thanks to St John's Presbyterian Church for hosting us today. Refreshments will be served in the hall adjacent to the building here. You're invited to stay and continue fellowship and conversation and community. Thank you again for your support for Hank and the extended family. And the words to conclude with from Jeremiah 29, verse 13 and 14, God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek with all your heart. I will be found, declares the Lord. Amen.